And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all still here. Then the jailer called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they told him one of the first foundational steps. They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, excuse me, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all of his, straight away. Just like uh, uh, one of our friends that's going to be baptized after service today. We're rejoicing with her. Scripture continues, And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all of his house. The title of what I want to preach to us about tonight, with the help of the Lord, simply this, Don't let the darkness decide. Don't let... The darkness decide. We're going to make sense of this in a moment. Would you put down your Bibles? Lift your voice. Lift your hands one more time before you're seated. Let the Lord know that you are wanting to hear from him. That every distraction is moved aside. That your heart is good ground for the word to take root in it. Jesus, we come before you with great expectation. Praying thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in South Dakota as it is in heaven. In Watertown as it is in heaven. At Jesus Church as it is in heaven. And in my life and my heart as it is in heaven. Let it be done. Let it be done. Lord, I pray you'd give deliverance, strength hope and revelation. If there's someone that needs the Holy Ghost, I pray that you would pour it out upon them. Give them the courage to repent and pray. And Lord, it is a promise you will give it to them. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, we believe. And the church said, Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. This story that we read about in Acts 16 was a night that Paul and Silas would never forget. The story of what happened that night would be passed down through the generations. And here we are around 2,000 years later still talking about what happened to Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16. If you are here and you've heard of this story before, I'm just curious. Would you raise your hand if you've ever heard of the story of Paul and Silas in the jail cell? Thank you. That looks about just about all of us. And for those that haven't heard it, don't worry. I'll fill you in. But if you have heard of this story, you may have even heard it all the way back in Sunday school if you had the privilege of growing up in church. Maybe you had a good Sunday school teacher like, like so many that are here, and maybe they taught you the, the basic story. Maybe on your Sunday school walls there was pictures and flannel graphs of uh, two, two men with big cheesy smiles on their faces and broken chains around their wrists, and everything was rainbows and skittles and unicorns. And of course we know that this story ends well, and that's great. The story ends in deliverance. But this story is anything but just a Sunday school story. This story is anything but just a rainbow and unicorn story. This, in fact, if I were to tell you that there was a story in the Bible that involved depression and doubt and bloodied uh, faces, bruised eyes, broken bones, depression, and attempted suicide, your mind may, almost attempted suicide, your mind may not immediately go to Acts chapter 16. And yet all those things I described are hallmarks of Acts chapter 16. This is anything but a Sunday school story. For those that aren't familiar, let me give you a very quick recap. Paul and Silas were traveling and evangelizing, and Paul had a vision from God to go to Macedonia. So they set sail. They obeyed the vision from God where a man appeared to them who was Macedonian and said, come preach the gospel to us. We have no one to tell us the gospel. So they obeyed. They set sail. They landed in a city called Philippi, and this city was in the district of Macedonia that the Lord had called them to. 
And immediately off the bat, it seemed like things were going pretty well. It seemed like this was definitely a God thing because shortly after getting there, they were able to witness to a lady named Lydia and her family, and this family was converted. Now, every conversion is important, regardless of background or socioeconomic status. Every soul that's saved is equally as important. However, what's neat about this is if you're going to plant a church uh, in a place you've never been, it would be pretty nice to win an entire family, much less a prominent family like Lydia's that had influence, much less a, a, a family like Lydia's that had financial security that could help fund the mission that Paul and Silas were starting. So this seemed like a pretty important catch and a pretty big win. And it seemed like things were going really well for Paul and Silas. But all of a sudden, next thing you know, right as things were taking off, things took a sharp turn for the worse. Has anybody ever had that happen before where it seemed like things were going so well and you were just getting ready to dance and celebrate on the mountaintop and next thing you know your foot slipped and you began sliding down the mountain and things began to get a little difficult in your life? This is what happened with Paul and Silas. You see, right after this, there was a young girl who was possessed by a demon. And this young girl began to follow Paul and Silas and shout things at them. And after a few days, Paul finally got sick of it. He turned around and rebuked the demon out of the young girl in Jesus' name. Cast out this demon. Now, again, you would think that things are going back up, right? You would think that the people of the city would be happy for this young girl, that she was freed from demonic possession and had liberty. But no, you see, she was a slave girl. Her owners were very upset because she was being used for the demonic powers that were within her to tell people's fortunes. And now that the demonic power was cast out, the owners could not make their money. They were very upset. And so they captured Paul and Silas and literally dragged them to the center of town by their coats. I told you that things start to get worse. And as if they couldn't get worse, they started to get even more worse because now they began accusing Paul and Silas of things they had not done. They began beating them viciously. The Bible says they received many blows. Another translation says they were beaten severely. And then as if things couldn't get worse, they do again. Amen. This is what they get, I guess, for following the will of God. Now they were cast into prison of a crime they did not commit. They were bloodied. They probably had broken bones. They were in intense pain. And now they were shackled to a wall. And guess what? History tells us that their shackles were probably spread as far apart as possible to keep them from getting into any kind of comfortable or sleeping position. This is the situation Paul and Silas found themselves in for seemingly doing nothing other than obeying the voice of God. And as the sun began to set, And the light began to leave their prison cell. Just bear with Brother Claiborne's imagination. I'm sure that Silas must have looked over at Paul and said, Paul, are you sure about that vision? Are you sure the Greek salad you ate the night before wasn't a little bit rotten? Are you sure that Greek pizza didn't have some old anchovies on it and you had some weird dreams after? Are, Are you sure that this was from God? And somehow Paul must have convinced Silas that things were going to be somewhat okay because verse 25 says at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. Listen, I bet you those prison walls had heard a lot of things over the years. I'm sure those walls had heard groaning. I'm sure those walls had heard crying, screaming, and even praying to whatever various gods the other prisoners served. But those walls had probably never, ever heard singing. Those walls had probably never, ever heard singing. And in the middle of the night, at the darkest hour, with all the prisoners around them listening, they began to sing. Now, just deal with Brother Claiborne's imagination here. I, I, I just imagine it may have happened something like this. You know, Paul was the one who got the vision from God, not Silas. So, so Paul is sitting there, and they're bloodied, and they've got broken bones. And, and Silas is upset, and Silas is in pain. And I just have to imagine maybe Paul just starts humming. Maybe Paul just starts humming something like, and Silas looks over at Paul with disgust and says, Paul, I know that you're not humming Waymaker right now. 
I, know, I don't know if you see where we are, but I know you're not humming that tune right now. And Paul says, come on, Silas, just sing it a little bit with me. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keep a light in the darkness. And Silas, come on, Paul, I don't want to. And Paul just convinced them. And the next thing you know, Silas says, fine. And begrudgingly starts singing with Paul. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. But as they begin to sing and as Silas begins to worship, all of a sudden, he doesn't notice that rib out of place as much anymore. All of a sudden he forgets the the pain that's in his eye because of that bruise anymore and the next thing you know they're probably singing at their full voice and i bet you paul probably gave silas the sign for the bridge and the next thing you know they're singing in unison even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working hallelujah and the next thing you know all the prisoners heard them singing a beautiful song called waymaker unto the lord you see paul and silas were so convinced of god God's love for them and so convinced of God's plan for them that not even a prison could stop their praise. Not even a trial could keep them from testifying. They made a decision in that moment. Hey, I'm not going to let the darkness decide for me. I'm not going to let my current circumstance decide for me. I may not be able to see two inches in front of my face. I may not know if rats are crawling around my feet right now and I may have a few ribs out of place, but this darkness does not get the final word. This darkness does not get the final say. God gave me a vision. So I'm not going to base my decision on the darkness. I'm going to base my decision on the vision that God gave to me weeks ago or months ago. Because the promises of God are true. They are yes and amen. And if God gave me a word, it's never going to fail. And it shall come to pass. Somebody praise him if you believe that this tonight. I've got a simple question for us tonight, church. Jesus Church in Watertown, South Dakota. My question for you, church, is can we still sing in the dark? Can we still make up our minds to praise in the pain? Can we still testify in the middle of the trial? Can we still be faithful when it seems like all hell is breaking loose around us? Can we still lift our voices and sing even when it does not make sense? Can we still declare the goodness of God even though we've got some pain that's aching in our body, in our mind, or in our spirit? Can we still sing in the dark? Can we make up in our minds tonight that no matter what happens, I am not going to let the darkness decide for me any longer. The Bible says this is what happened when they praised. Verse 26 says, and suddenly, thank you, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Listen, I know you've heard this preached a million times, but it's worth repeating. When you decide to praise in spite of what's going on, when you decide to be faithful to church in spite of that diagnosis, when you decide to come even though an awkward situation is going on and it makes you want to stay home, when you decide to praise anyhow, amen, it doesn't just benefit you, although it does, but other people around you who are listening and watching say, my God, if that brother can worship with that diagnosis, what's my excuse? If that sister can worship after that divorce, What's my excuse? Come on, if that young man can worship, even though what's going on in his family, then what's my excuse? Your praise, your faithfulness, your worship is not just for you, but there are more people watching you than you realize. Your children are watching you. Your family are watching you. Your friends are watching you. People in the community, your neighbors are watching how you will react to the different circumstances of life. And your praise unto God, regardless of the situation, will not just set your bands free, but it will set loose the chain of others as well. Somebody praise him if you believe that. And so they praised and there was an earthquake. And it took an earthquake to open all the prison doors. Can I remind you of something you already know? That some things will not open until they have been shaken. Some things will not open until they have been shaken. Here in Acts chapter 16, it was not only the prison doors, but it was also the jailer's heart. It was not opened until it was shaken. 
In Matthew 27 and 54, what about this, the, the, the Roman centurion? It was an earthquake that opened the eyes of a Roman centurion to see who Jesus really was. For those who don't remember the story, there was a man, a centurion, guarding the cross of Jesus. He was not a believer. He was there to make sure no one took the body off the cross before Jesus had died. Amen. So he's standing there at the foot of the cross. Now Jesus is giving up the ghost. He's dying in the flesh. And the, 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 the uh, sky begins to get dark. And there begins to be thunder and lightning. And the next thing you know, the ground begins to shake under that centurion's feet and an earthquake took place. And it was at that moment that he looked up towards the cross and he said, truly, this was the son of God. Truly, this man is who he claimed to be. He had to be shaken in order to receive vision. He had to be shook in order to see who Jesus really was. Can I remind someone some things and some people and some hearts will not be opened until they have been shaken. And I believe with all of my heart, all of this worldwide chaos that we've been seeing, and I don't like it, and you don't like it. And thankfully in South Dakota, you all have had some shelter from it and a little bit more freedom than others. But you can see what's going on in the world. And I'm not saying God invented it all. I'm not saying God sent it. Certainly not saying that. But I am saying that God gets beauty out of ashes, and God can use chaos to create calm and and use problems to create a purpose in people's lives. So I believe with with all my heart uh, that God can use all of this chaos to open doors of opportunity. If you're worried about the worldwide devastation, can I tell you, I believe that God is going to use worldwide devastation to bring worldwide revelation. In fact, I believe he's doing it right now. As we speak, there will be a day that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And it may take some devastation in order to bring people to that revelation. Do not despise the trials that might come your way. Do not despise all the shaking because you never know what God might be accomplishing through the trial, through the shaking, through the difficulty. I believe God is opening doors and he's opening hearts that were previously closed to us because the world has been shaken. Somebody praise him right now. This is obvious. You know this is true. You, you, you all saw this in, in, in 2020 and even maybe even this year, maybe in your own families or friends' lives. We, we all know about the prodigals that came home, so many prodigals that came home across the nation and even around the world during 2020 because everything was so shaken. It reminded those prodigals that the secular ground under their feet was not as sturdy as they thought it was. And it caused them to run back to the father's house. And of course, the father's so good and merciful, he took them back in. That's one example, one benefit of what the shaking has accomplished. But it's not just prodigals. God, God has used the shaking to wake up atheists and agnostics and unbelievers and people of different faiths and religions to see. They say, you know what? I don't know what's going on, but I know something's going on. This, something's odd. Something's weird. What, what's happening with world leaders? What's happening around the globe? Something is up. Something is fishy. And I don't have all the answers, but I know something's going on. And, and this world is broken, and I've got to find answers. This is the church's finest hour because the world has been so shaken. They're looking for answers. And we we are the only ones in the world. I say that without hyperbole or without shame. We are the only ones in the world that have an explanation and an answer to the spiritual chaos that's taking place in our world. It is a spirit of the Antichrist and unbelievers don't know what's going on, but you and I, we know what's going on and we've got the hope. We've got the antidote. We've got the remedy to all the chaos and the, and the, the stuff that's going on in the world right now. This is the church's finest hour. We can go out and find the people who who have been shaken, the people who have been disturbed, and we can bring them to the house of God and show them what their heart has been missing. 2020, over, over, uh, you know, I know technology is never a replacement for what we get to do tonight, to gather together. But I am thankful that we have that additional ministry as well. If, if we're streaming right now, if anyone's watching online, God bless all of you watching online. We saw in 2020 prodigals who were not able to come to church due to their own lockdowns or whatever, watching on a live stream, being renewed in the Holy Ghost in their living rooms. Before, they weren't turning, tuning into any churches, but their world was shaken. They began to tune in. My wife and I have family members who hadn't spoken tongues in years, but the pandemic happened and the lockdowns happened and they tuned into church. 
Because they knew something spiritual was going on, and God refilled them, renewed them in their living rooms. Amen. There was a young lady in Mexico. I had the privilege of preaching in a Spanish congregation in Southern California, and everything was shut down. It was so tight, so locked down there. All we could do was I was just preaching to a camera. I had to do a lot of that in 2020. Thank God that that's mostly over. And so I'm preaching to this camera, and, and I didn't know it, but there was a young lady that was tuned in that night, and uh, she had previously wanted nothing to do with God. Wanted nothing to do with the church. And, and, and someone, she had a loose connection in the church and they tried to share a little bit of the gospel with her. She wanted nothing to do with it. Now the lockdowns happened. She couldn't leave her town in Mexico. She didn't know what was going on. She began to look for answers and she looked in the right place. And she tuned into the live stream and she heard a preacher preaching just a simple message about the gospel. And by the time it was over, she contacted her loose connection in the church and she said, I've heard the gospel today. I believe it and I want to be baptized in Jesus' name. That would have never happened had her world not been first shaken. And the last I checked, they were sending a missionary three hours one way to baptize her in the name of Jesus Christ. Some things will not open until they have been shaken. Amen. There's another quick example of this. I think this, I need to mention this. Uh, you know, everyone reacted differently to the pandemic and uh, some reacted with more fear than others. And I certainly don't wish to undermine the genuine sickness. And I'm sure you also, like myself, had friends and loved ones that passed away from the virus or at least complications caused by it or whatever. And so, uh, uh, but, but I certainly don't advocate for living in fear regardless. And uh, there was a situation uh, in, in Southern California that due to this shaking, God answered five years of prayers in just two days. Let me explain. Several years ago, uh, a young man named Edwin came into Edwin. If you ever listen to this, love you, bro. Uh, Edwin came into the church, and I had the privilege to begin to teach him Bible studies and all of that. And Edwin got baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. He was so excited to be saved. Uh, He had really struggled with depression and anxiety, and God brought him out of that. And he said, listen, I'm so glad to be saved, and I will live for God by myself for the rest of my life if I have to. He said, but I don't want to. I want my family to know Jesus as well. He said, will you start praying for me for my family? I said, absolutely. So for five years, we prayed for his family, especially his father, Mr. Sanchez. And for five years, Mr. Sanchez, who was a kind man, but he never came to church. He was too busy with work, traveling all over the nation and in Mexico, working, working, working. He was addicted to his work. And then 2020 happened. Everything shut down. And now there was no more work. And now there was no more jobs. And now the demons that he had been running from in his life, now that he didn't have work to distract himself, now that he couldn't be a workaholic anymore and busy himself with that, now he was forced to face the demons in his life. And he came very close to having a nervous breakdown. His son, Edwin, told me about this. He was living in so much fear over the pandemic. And I don't... don't, uh, uh, This may sound odd to you, but it certainly was not a laughing matter for him. At the time, he was so afraid and he was receiving this fearful information that he went throughout his house and began to take all the doorknobs off the doors in the house because he was so afraid that somehow the virus could be transmitted from touching those doorknobs, even in his own house with his children. He was a a grown adult, a good man, but terrified. The spirit of fear had overtaken his heart and mind. And so, once again, his son made the appeal that he'd been doing for five years. Dad, would you like to come to church? And now, because his dad's world was shaken up, his dad said, son, I will come to church. He came on a Sunday morning. I was privileged to be there and watch this happen. He stood in the back, had a mask on. I didn't even recognize him. By the time the service was over, I saw all I saw was a man with his hands lifted, a mask on, tears coming down his face. I went back there to pray. I realized it was Mr. Sanchez. I said, Mr. Sanchez, I'm going to lay my hand on your head. I believe you can be filled with the Holy Ghost today. And when you feel that trembling in your mouth, if you're comfortable, I want you to just pull that mask down and let that heavenly language come flooding out of your mouth. We put our hands on his head a few minutes later. Later, he pulled his mask down and he began speaking in other tongues as the spirit of God gave him the utterance. God filled him with joy. God filled him with peace. God filled him with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And for the first time in months, the fear had left. For the first time in months, a smile as big as Texas came across his face and he was flooded with the joy of the Lord. That's the power of the Holy Ghost. That's the power that God gets out of difficult situations. That's what God can do when people's hearts and minds are shaken. 
He went home and his son, my friend, began to teach him Bible studies on baptism in Jesus' name. And two days later, I had the privilege of taking Mr. Sanchez to our church, taking him to the baptistry. I baptized him in Jesus' name. He went down uh, as Mr. Sanchez and he came up as Brother Sanchez. And all of his sins there at the bottom of that baptismal tank. I'm telling you, his son told me, he said, I have not seen my dad smile like this in 20 years. He said, I don't know if I've ever seen my dad have this much joy and this much peace. That's the power of what God can do. If you give your world to him when it's shaken, if you give yourself to him in the middle of a trial, if you put your pain in its proper place, if you put your pain in the palms of Jesus, he can take you, turn your situation and turn your life around, give you hope and joy and peace like you never thought possible. Come on, somebody praise him right now. i got to hurry. Verse 27 and 29 of Acts 16. The Bible says, after all this happened, just stay with me. I'm closer to being done than you might think. The Bible says, the jailer awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and he would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had fled. Now, this is a part of the story we don't hear talked about too often. But I think it's worth focusing on. Scripture continues, but Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all still here. Then the jailer called for lights and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. His life was spared. I want you to notice something. The jailer came inches away from ending his life. Inches away from ending his life. The blade pointed toward his belly, the sharp part probably inches away from his stomach, this close to taking his own life and committing suicide that night in the darkness. Why? Well, you see, it's because he thought that all of his prisoners had left and that his occupation and his reputation were ruined. They lived in an honor and shame society. So in one night, to have your occupation and your reputation ruined. You see, no one would hire him as a jailer anymore, knowing that he let all the, all, all the prisoners loose on his watch. And not only that, reputation in the ancient world was a big deal, and no one would trust him for anything. He would be shamed, maybe even beat and hurt for what he had done. And so he felt that his life was no longer worth living. But can I ask you again, why? Is it because all the prisoners had actually left, and his occupation and his reputation were actually ruined? No. The reason he almost took his life is because he assumed that all of that took place. The reason why he almost ended his life that night is because he assumed that everyone was gone and his life was over. He came this close, this close to acting on an assumption. The jailer that night came this close. He almost made a big decision in the middle of his darkness. But can I remind someone that his fears did not line up with the facts. What he assumed to be true was wrong. And it was when he called for lights, when the light switch was flicked on, he saw that his assumption was wrong and all hope was not lost and things were not as bad as he thought that they were. Can I just preach to someone that might be going through a trial tonight? I know it's tough and I know it's hard. But can I just preach that maybe, just maybe, things are not quite as bad as you think that they are? Can I just preach to you not to believe all the things that you think in the dark? Can I just remind you, do not act based on your assumptions. Do not make a big decision in the middle of the darkness. Do not make a big decision when your mind is in a fog and nothing is making sense. Do not let the darkness decide. Do not let the darkness decide. Do not let the diagnosis decide. Do not let the trial decide. Do not let the divorce decide. Have faith. Get on your knees and call for lights. And let the father of lights come down and illuminate your situation. And show you that things aren't over. Things aren't as hopeless as you thought they are. There's still hope. There's still joy. There's still peace to be had. Do not believe the things that your mind tells you in the dark. Do not let the darkness decide for you any longer. Somebody praise him right now. Oh, Jesus. Come on, somebody clap your hands really quickly. (laughs) 
Hallelujah. How many times, Pastor Brown, how many times, Brother Chemist, have we seen people either leave God or leave their devotion all because of an assumption? How many times have, have we seen this play out in friends or loved ones' lives or people maybe that used to go to this church that should be here tonight and we wish they were here tonight, but all because of an assumption? You know, pastor, pastor shook their hand six times, but he only shook my hand three times. And so he must not like me and he must hate me and that church must not like me. And I just, no, no, no one there cares about me and I'm out of here. That's quite a big assumption, isn't it? Somebody that maybe, maybe feels like, you know what, there's just no one in my life left. There's no one in my life who cares for me. No one, no one in life who's taken the time to, to be with me or whatever. Can I tell you something? That's an assumption. You're assuming the same thing the jailer thought. The jailer thought everyone had left. He thought everyone was gone. And it wasn't until the lights came on that he saw that, no, everyone had not left him. And, 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 and someone here or someone online needs to hear the voice of, of, of God telling you what Paul told the jailer. Do not give up, sir. Do not give up, man. We have not left. We are all still here. There are still people of God right here around you that care about you, that love you. They have not left you. They are here for you, here to help you, here to strengthen you, here to love you, here to be here for you, here to bake cookies for you and do whatever else that you need. There are people around that love you. And even if it were true that everyone in your life really had left you, even though that's a very, very rare thing to happen, even if that were true, you still have a God in heaven who explicitly promised that he would never leave you and never forsake you. You are never alone. Stop believing those lies. Stop isolating yourself. Stop believing those assumptions that come to you in the dark. How many times... Do we get depressed because we assume? We assume there's no more hope for my family. We assume, I've been praying for five years and so and so still hasn't come to God. I've been praying for 10 years, they still haven't come back to truth. And so you just begin to assume that it's never gonna happen. You begin to assume that they're unreachable. And I know at the end of the day, it's their choice. I know at the end of the day, God's a gentleman. He doesn't force himself on anyone. But you need to understand that with God, nothing shall be impossible. And until that trumpet sounds, it's not over yet, honey. And so don't assume. Don't assume that your prayers aren't working. Oh, I wish someone would hear this preacher. Don't assume that your prayers are not reaching heaven. Don't assume that there's no more hope for that lost loved one. Don't assume that they'll never come back. It might take five years or ten years. And I know that's hard and I hate it for you. But it's not over until God says it's over. And there is light at the end end of that tunnel. There is hope and joy. Don't act based on on, on an assumption. How many times, oh God, how many times have we, have we, have we thought, you know what? I, 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 I know that God loves them and has forgiven them, but there's no way that God could forgive me. No, no, there's, there's not enough grace. There's not enough blood to cover me. I know maybe them, and, and I know maybe I believe that God could forgive me a year ago, but with what I just did, with the mistakes I just made a few weeks ago or a month ago, there's no way that God could forgive me. His grace, uh, his grace can't go that far. His blood can't go that far. You pastor, you don't know what I did in the darkness and you don't know the thoughts I've struggled with. And you don't know the mistakes I've made. Yeah, I get it. Jesus is merciful, but there's no way that he could forgive me this time. There's no way that his grace could go that far. There's no way his blood and his love could go that far. And can I tell you something? You're believing a lie. You're believing an assumption. You're believing something that is not true. Hallelujah. As long as we're here and before that trumpet sounds, there is grace and there is mercy and there is redemption and there is deliverance for you and for I. It doesn't matter the mistakes you've made. If you're willing to repent tonight in an altar, it's as simple as that, honey. God will take you back. There is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just people who need no repentance. That's the God that we serve. Stop assuming there's no more hope. Stop assuming there's no more grace. It's all a lie from the enemy. And a lie has no more power until it's believed. A lie has no power until it is believed. So don't believe it. The Bible says don't even give place to Satan. Don't even let his foot get into, uh, get a door hold, get a foothold in your life. Amen. Instead, you got to decide whose report am I going to believe? I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. This report says that I may not be perfect and I may be messed up, but such were some of you that I can be saved, sanctified, set free, and delivered. 
that I can be freed from depression, that I can be freed from suicidal thoughts, that I can be freed from my sin and my cycles of addiction. Hallelujah. Do we still believe that God does that and sets people free in 2021? We've got to stop assuming that some people are too far. We've got to stop assuming that some problems are too big. Come on. I don't care if you're struggling with gender identity issues or or sexual identity issues or pornography issues or drug issues. It does not matter. God's blood is more than enough to cover all that. If you're willing to repent, be baptized in his name and filled with the Holy Ghost. And if you're already baptized and already filled, then all you got to do is repent and God will take you home. Somebody praise him again. Hallelujah. I got to hurry. I got to hurry. Some of those hopeless and some of those hopeless and negative thoughts that you've been thinking. Can I tell you, that's just the darkness trying to influence your mind. That's just the spirit of the age trying to convince you there's no reason to get out of bed in the morning. There's no purpose. There's no hope. Amen. So, some of those thoughts that even seem mild, but it's negative. But, but it's like, yeah, I know pastor's preaching that, and I know we're pushing for that. But come on, you know, I, I just don't really know if all that could happen. I, you know, we're best to just settle for this and not to shoot so big. You know, that's kind of dramatic. I don't, I don't know if we can really hit that big. I mean, we'll just be happy with, with 100 people or, or 110. And, you know, I don't know if we're really ever, you know, just do much more that come on. Can we just stay here a little bit? Can we listen? All of those things are assumptions and they may seem mild and they may seem logical, but if they are contrary to the word of God, if they are contrary to the word that is being declared over this pulpit, if they're contrary to the vision that God has for this church and for this state, then you need to get those assumptions out of your mind and say, God, I'm getting you out of the box with you. Nothing shall be impossible with you. You can turn this city, this state, and this world upside down. I'm going to stop assuming and I'm going to stop putting you in a box. Anything is possible to those who believe. Jesus, Jesus. Come on, put your hands together again. I still feel the Holy Ghost. And when you feel like you can't see straight, get on your knees, call for lights and pray. And God will illuminate it. And God will show you that things aren't quite the way that you thought that they were. John chapter 1 and verse 5 says, And the light shines on in the darkness, but the darkness has not mastered it. It has not overcome it. I just need to tell someone again, do not ever give up, no matter what comes your way. Because the darkness will never overcome the light of God. And can I tell someone here today... And I want the musician to come if they're able. The darkness cannot define you. The darkness cannot define you. You might feel like it does, but darkness does not define. Somebody hear that? I want you to hear that again. Darkness does not define. Only light can do that. Only light can bring definition. Darkness just hides and obscures what is really there. This is why whenever I want to look slimmer and hide my COVID pounds, I wear all black. Because I want to obscure the definition. I want to hide it. (laughs) Your darkness has not defined you. Can I tell you something? It has actually only hidden things that only the light of God can reveal. Your darkness has not defined you. It has hidden potentials, anointing, skills, and abilities in you that you don't even know that you possessed. And when you begin to give yourself over to God and turn yourself over to the light, God will begin to shine that floodlight on you and you will realize, wow, I didn't even know I was capable of that. I didn't realize that potential, that anointing. I didn't realize that that was in me. Amen. Your darkness has not defined you no matter what you've done, no matter what mistakes you've made. It is only hidden and obscured the potential that has always resided within you. And when you give yourself to God, you will see all that God can do in your life. Say, preacher, why are you preaching this? Why are you so passionate about this tonight? And I'm I'm, I'm moving to a close. Why are you preaching this? Because I, I know what it's like to sit in darkness. I know what it's like to let darkness make my decisions for me. 
and not, not think on my own and not have conversations with God and make decisions together, but instead to let the darkness, to let the imagination, the things my mind tells me in the dark, make my decisions for me without even initially realizing it. I know what that's like. I know what it's like to be far from God and wonder if there's any hope. I know what it's like to live in sin and depression. And I know I'm preaching to the choir tonight, but I feel, listen, I know God's reaching for someone and I don't care if it's one or two or three people. I can put my... I know what it's like to start believing the lies that the darkness tells. And because of that, begin to make self-destructive and harmful decisions. I know what it's like to believe the dark voice of hopelessness. I know what it's like to come to the point of almost giving up. And I want everyone watching today to raise your hand if you have ever felt like giving up. Should be just about all of us. Put your hands down. No, I want everyone who is also thankful that they did not give up to raise their hands. Look around you and receive hope from your brothers and sisters. The book of Micah chapter 7 and verse 8 says, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, for when I fall I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. You see, I know what it's like to sit in darkness, but I also know what it's like to begin living in the light. I know what it's like to live in bitterness, but now I know what it's like to live in blessing. I know what it's like to live in fear, but now I know what it's like to live in faith because I gave my life to God. I know what it's like to feel absolutely hopeless, but now I know what it's like to live in an abundance of hope. I used to let the darkness rule my life, but I'm glad to tell you today that for the past 10 years after I gave my life to God, I have been living in the light. And I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but you need to know, I don't care if you're a saint of God or a visitor, you don't have to let the darkness the depression, the fear rule your life any longer. You can live in the light. You can live in the hope and joy of Jesus Christ. Don't listen to the darkness. The darkness says there's no hope. The light says otherwise. The darkness says that you've seen too much sin for you to still have a healthy marriage. That's a lie from hell. It may be a fight at times. Paul called it the fight of faith, but you're not fighting alone. You have a God that's fighting with you, living on the inside if you've been filled with the Holy Ghost fighting for you. You have his word, which the psalmist said is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Peter called God's word and his promises a light shining in a dark place. You have more than you think you have. And I'm going to make up in my mind tonight. If the preacher's preaching to me, I'm going to make up in my mind tonight. I'm not going to let the darkness decide for me any longer. Oh, the light of God is so powerful. We take it for granted sometimes, I think, church, those of us who have been living for God for a while, sometimes we forget just how dark the world is and just how much light that we have in this place tonight. I'll never forget. I'm closing with this story. Thank you for your patience. I will never forget one of the most powerful examples of the light of God flooding down into a human heart. I was preaching in Spokane, Washington. It was the last day of 2020. I was preaching a New Year's Eve service on a Thursday night. And I didn't know, I didn't know all that God was going to do that night. You see, what happened was there was a man. He was an elderly man. His name was Brother Cecil. I loved him. He's a good man, a pillar of the church. He passed away from a combination of COVID and the smoke from the wildfires that were raging the Northwest at the time. He sadly passed away. And he had left a grandson behind, and he was like a dad to that grandson. And and Cecil and his wife were saved, but his grandson, whose name is Isaiah, his grandson was not saved. And his grandpa had been praying for Isaiah for years to be saved, to come to God. And Cecil, his grandfather, died without ever seeing his grandson come to God. And so (laughs) I didn't realize that that Thursday night, that New Year's Eve service, Isaiah, his grandson, was there. I had never met him before. He was sitting in the back, a rough-looking character in his young 20s. What I also didn't know was that very day, 
Isaiah had picked up the phone and called his grandmother, the widow of the man who had passed away. And he said, Grandma, he said, I can't do this anymore. I can't handle living anymore. I can't handle the difficulties of this life. He said, I am going to end my life and I might even do it today. He said, Grandpa's gone. He was like a father figure to me. I have no hope. I have no reason to live. I'm taking my life. She said, Isaiah, please don't do it. Please, honey, there is hope. Don't do it. He said, Grandma, I'm going to do it. She said, listen, would you please give God a chance? There's a New Year's Eve service happening tonight. Would you just come and give Jesus a chance? He said, I don't know, Grandma. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. He hung up the phone. Grandma got on her knees and began interceding for her grandchild. A friend who knew him, who, who was rooming with him that I knew, also told me that he watched Isaiah go and get his handgun out of storage that had been in storage for a long time, begin to load the chamber, clean it, cock it, make sure that it worked correctly. This all happened on Thursday, New Year's Eve. But by the grace and mercies of God, Isaiah decided to give Jesus a chance. And he came to church that night and he heard a preacher preaching a not so great sermon, uh, but just a decent sermon about, about how God can deliver from anything, about how no darkness and no depression and no anxiety is too big for Jesus to heal, about how Jesus loves each and every one of us unbelievably, about how nothing can separate us from the love of God. That means nothing we've done, nothing that's been done to us, or nothing that we've seen could ever separate us from the love of God. He heard a preacher preach that message that night. He came to the altar call, staggered his way to the front. He was the first one to the altar, lifted his hands, tears coming on his face, repented, and he began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. And that very night, he was the only one that was filled with the Holy Ghost that night, but I was fine with that. That very night in a single moment, God saved his physical and his spiritual life in a single moment. And I'm happy to tell you that Isaiah is still alive and well with us today, because in a single night, he found his reason for living. He found his reason for life. He found his purpose. He found the reason why we're all here. And one single night, Isaiah felt the light and the power of God and decided, I'm not going to let the darkness decide for me any longer. I don't care what you're dealing with. I don't, it doesn't matter what you're struggling with. If God could pull a young man back from the throes of suicide, then whatever kind of hell you're walking through tonight, God can set you free. God can bring you out of it. God can bring you abundant life, hope and joy and peace smack dab in the middle of your chaos. I'm done preaching. I want us to stand all over this house. Stand all over this house. I want us to lift our hands all over this place. Come on, come on. The Lord has been directing my eyes to some of you. I know God's been talking to some of you. Come on, reach out to him right now. Come on, there's nothing too hard for the Lord. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. Come on, that's it. You're a child of God. You can walk in joy. You can walk in peace. It doesn't mean your circumstances have to be perfect. It means that you can have a new, fresh perspective right in the middle of your difficult trial. Come on, right now in this moment. I want you to stay in the spirit of prayer right now in this moment. If God has spoken to you tonight or if you are here and you need deliverance or you need the Holy Ghost, these altars are open to you. You can come, take a step of faith and pray. If God has spoken to you, if you need deliverance or if you need the Holy Ghost, I want you to come to this front and the church is going to gather around and pray as well. In the name of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. Come on, make up your mind tonight. I'm giving my darkness to him. I'm giving my trial to him. That's it, young lady. That's it, young man. That's it, sir. That's beautiful. Yeah, God's been tugging on you. There's a beautiful future for you. Come on, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Come on, God wants to give you joy unspeakable and full of glory. Come on, if you need the Holy Ghost, don't miss your moment. That's beautiful. Keep on coming. Come to this front. Lift your hands and lift your heart to God. Let Him overwhelm you. Let Him fill you with the baptism of the Spirit till you're speaking in tongues. That's it, church. This is it. God's telling me to stop. This is the moment right now. That's it. Lift your voice. Do what you know to do. 
Get in touch with God right now. Come on, if you need the Holy Ghost, don't worry about anyone else around you. Lift your hands, close your eyes and pray. Let those tears fall. Don't worry about anyone else around you.